Chapter 3, Imagination, the ignition key to your automatic success mechanism. To carry on a successful business, a man must have imagination. He must see things as in a vision, a dream of the whole thing. Charles Schwab, Industrialist. Imagination plays a far more important role in our lives than most of us realize. I have seen this demonstrated many times in my practice. A, particular, a particularly memorable instance concerned a patient who was literally forced to visit my office by his family. He was a man of about 40, unmarried, who held down a routine job during the day and kept to himself in his apartment when, he, when the work day was over. Never going anywhere, never doing anything. He had many such jobs and never seemed to stay with any of them for a great length of time. His problem was that he had a rather large nose and ears that protruded a little more than normal. He considered himself ugly and funny looking. He imagined that the people he came into contact with during the day were laughing at him and talking about him behind his back because he was so odd. His imaginings grew so strong that he actually feared going out into the business world and moving among people. He hardly felt safe even in his own home. The poor man even imagined that his family was ashamed of him because he was peculiar looking, not like the other people. Actually, his facial deficiencies were not serious. His nose was of the classical Roman type, and his ears, although somewhat large, attracted no more attention than those of thousands of people with similar ears. In desperation, his family brought him to me to see if I could help him. I saw that he did not need surgery, only an understanding of the fact that his imagination had wrought such havoc with his self-image that he had lost sight of the truth. He was not really ugly. People did not consider him odd and laugh at him because of his appearance. His imagination alone was responsible for his misery. His imagination had set up an automatic failure mechanism within him and it was operating full blast to his extreme misfortune. Unfortunately, after several sessions with him and with the help of his family, he was gradually able to realize that the power of his own imagination was responsible for his plight. And he succeeded in building up a true self-image and achieving confidence that he needed by applying the creative imagination rather than destructive imagination. You might say he needed emotional surgery, not physical surgery with an actual scalpel. In the latter years of my surgical practice, I became quite skilled at talking myself out of business. <laughs> this is an analogy for the experiences of thousands of people, quite possibly in one way or another, including you. No, you may not feel ashamed of your nose or ears or any other physical feature, but you may not be a recluse. Many people believe there is something about them that causes others to look down on them, to ridicule them behind their backs, to reject them something that prevents them from progressing in certain ways. One of the smartest, most successful and prolific idea men I've ever known in the advertising field has had a lifelong pattern of rising to high income, then suddenly experiencing circumstances that pull the rug out from under him so that he must rebuild from scratch 
his reputation, and his finances. One month, he was living in a mansion. The next in a motel. He admitted to me and to others that he has spent his entire life trying to escape the iron-fisted grip of what he calls his white trash ancestry. And to paraphrase Al Pacino in one of the Godfather movies, just as he gets out, he is again pulled back. Of course, this thing that keeps pulling him back does not exist in the physical world, only inside his own image. It's his ugly nose and big ears. What's yours? Ironically, even though his entire business is the imagination business, he has yet to discover how to use his imagination as a scalpel in emotional surgery to rid himself of his self-image of its big nose. Creative imagination is not something reserved for the poets the philosophers, the inventors. It enters into our every act. Imagination sets the goal picture that our automatic mechanism works on. We act or fail to act, not because of will, as is so commonly believed, but because of imagination. This is the most important statement to be gleaned from this entire book. Human beings always act feel and perform in accordance with what they imagine to be true about themselves and their environment. You cannot long escape or outperform that picture. You can dissect it, analyze it, uncover what is in it that is not true about yourself and alter it. You can modify it without archaeological examination of the past, but you cannot escape it. You will always act and perform and experience, appropri- and experience appropriate results in accordance with what you imagine to be true about yourself and your environment. This is a basic and fundamental law of mind. It is the way we are built. When we see this law of mind graphically and dramatically demonstrated in a hypnotized subject, we are prone to think that there is something occult or super normal at work or to discredit it as simple stage illusion. Actually, what we are witnessing often is the normal operating processes of the human brain and nervous system. For example, if a good hypnotic subject is told that she is at the North Pole, she will not only shiver and appear to be cold, Her body will react just as if she were cold and goose pimples will develop. The same phenomena has been demonstrated on wide awake college students by asking them to imagine that one hand is immersed in ice water. Thermometer readings show that temperature drops in the treated hand occur. Tell a hypnotized subject that your finger is red hot and he will not only grimace with pain at your touch but his cardiovascular and lymphatic systems will react just as if your finger were a red hot poker and produce inflammation and perhaps a blister on the skin in one demonstration when college students were wide awake they had been told to imagine that a spot on their foreheads was hot Temperature readings documented an actual increase in skin temperature. These are elementary experiments just one step away from the rather cruel but common children's game, a practical joke played at school and sometimes by adults at work. In this prank, a person is secretly targeted by the group. Then one person after another engages the target in conversation, asking, Aren't you feeling well, Bob? You look pretty white-faced. Bob, are you feeling all right? Hey, Bob, are you okay? Soon, poor Bob is in the West Room, checking himself out in the mirror. Before long, Bob is feeling queasy and weak. Bob may actually even become sick, that he must go lie down or go home. Your nervous system cannot tell the difference between an imagined experience and a real one. 
your nervous system reacts appropriately to what you think or imagine to be true. This phenomenon that can be produced as a practical joke or by a hypnotist on stage for entertainment is actually identical to or illustrative of the basic process that governs much of our behavior and that can be taken a hold of and deliberately used to advantage. How the hypnotic power of negative imagination can be a fatal disease. When I wrote my book for physicians in 1936, New Faces, New Futures, about the impact of plastic surgery on personality, I reprinted it in a newspaper article from a St. Louis newspaper headlined Inferiority Complex Caused by Long Nose Drives College Student to Commit Suicide. When I wrote my book for physicians in 19, this article reported the suicide of a 24-year-old student of Washington University named Theodore Hoffman. Ironically, the article reported that those who knew him considered him popular. Here is the text of this young man's suicide note. To the world, when I was a child, other children abused and mistreated me because I was weaker and uglier than they. I was a sensitive, bashful boy and was teased because of my long face and long nose. The more they offended me, the more they teased. I became afraid of people. I knew that many of them hated me for things that I was not responsible for. My sentimental nature and my appearance. I was unable to speak to anyone. My confidence was gone. My teacher spelled my name with two F's, although it only has one. Yet I became so backward, I was unable to correct her and therefore spelled it with two F's throughout my school career. God forgive everyone for this. I am afraid of the world, but I'm not afraid to die. At the time, a professor at the university judged this to be the most severe case of an inferiority complex ever known. Nonsense. Believe me. Nonsense. Believe me, this young man's desperation, which first killed his self-image and then led him to take his own life, mirrors the same desperation affecting thousands and thousands of people and missed entirely or underestimated in importance by the people around them. In fact, suicide among teenagers in recent years has reached epidemic proportions, though rarely discussed in media. Anorexia is a chilling demonstration of the hypnotic power of negative imagination. In Battling the Inner Dummy, the authors David Weiner and Dr. Gilbert Hefter describe an encounter with a 15-year-old girl Ellen shows on the CBS television program 48 hours in 1988. Ellen weighed only 82 pounds, looked like a sickly child wasting away, but Ellen was firmly convinced that she was fat. As a result, she avoided meals, she refused to eat, and would even purge herself after eating. In a children's hospital room, the television reporter interviewing her got to stand in front of a full-length mirror and ask her if she saw how gaunt and weak she looked. I think I look fat, Ellen insisted. The reporter then tried factual information. But you only weigh 82 pounds. Do you think that is a person who is fat? Ellen sensibly replied no. But then... Ellen immediately said that she was fat and would grow fatter if she ate. So, determined to not eat, Ellen would pull out the intravenous feeding needles if not closely supervised. For parents, teachers, counselors, and coaches, this should be a cautionary tale, a vivid reminder of the need to be ever vigilant for some young person whose self-image is shrinking so drastically that self-inflicted harm is likely to follow. For all, it is a vivid illustration of the incredible power of imagination. 
A person can so magnify the importance of some flaw and of the world's response to the flaw with his own negative imagination that he commits suicide. A person can similarly so color her perceptions of her strength and opportunities with her own positive imagination that she accepts the most amazing things. The Secret of Hypnotic Power In the 1950s, Dr. Theodore, Theodore Xenophon Barber conducted extensive research into the phenomena of hypnosis, both when he was associated with the psychology, psychology department of American University in Washington, D.C., and also after becoming associated with the Laboratory of Social Relations at Harvard. Writing in Science Digest, he said, We have found that hypnotic subjects are able to do surprising things only when convinced that the hypnotist's words are true statements. When the hypnotist has guided the subject to the point where he is convinced that the hypnotist's words are true statements, then the subject behaves differently because he thinks and believes differently. The phenomena of hypnosis has always seemed to be mysterious because it has always been difficult to understand how belief can bring about such unusual behavior. It always seemed as if there must be something more, something unfathomable, some unfathomable force or power at work. However, the plain truth is that when a hypnotist or uh, however the plain truth is that when a subject is convinced that he is deaf, he behaves as if he is deaf. When he is convinced that he is insensitive to pain, he can undergo surgery without anesthesia. The mysterious force or power does not exist. Could you be hypnotized? Science Digest, January 1958. Note that his comments were published in 1958. Today, hypnosis is a tool of therapy and is widely accepted and used. For many, hypnosis and self-hypnosis to facilitate weight loss makes the surgical quick fix of liposuction unnecessary. And a perfect analogy to my examples of emotional surgery versus actual surgery. In these cases, hypnosis is the scalpel, and in dentistry, hypnosis used to facilitate treatment of the phobic patient. In dentistry, hypnosis used to facilitate treatment of the phobic patient with virtually uncontrollable anxiety, and in many instances, prove, proves to be a perfectly successful alternative to the problematic solution of anesthesia. With regard to the links between childhood programming, past experiences, and peer programming on one hand, and the imagination, the self-image, and the servo mechanism on the other, my conclusion is that people are literally hypnotized by their own self-images. In fact, many people virtually sleepwalk through their entire lives under unrecognized hypnotic suggestion. In Quentin Reynolds' book, Intuition, Your Secret Power, a hypnosis is quoted as saying, Clients visit me hoping that I will one day put them in a trance and fix their lives. In fact, many of them live in a trance and need a dose of reality. If you are stuck in a dark elevator for a couple of frightening hours as a child, you may still be fearful of elevators, unable to get into an elevator 40 years later regardless of all the safety statistics, factual information, and demonstration. Observation of thousands using elevators, or even the daunting task of hiking up dozens of flights of stairs. You are still in the hypnotic trance from 40 years ago. Still, a little reflection will show why it is a very good thing for us that we do feel and act according to what we believe or imagine to be true. All of this does not mean the system itself is bad, it only requires learning how to better use the system. 
Truth determines action and behavior. The human brain and nervous system are engineered to react automatically and appropriately to the problems and challenges in the environment. For example, a man does not need to stop and think that self-survival requires that he run if he meets a grizzly bear on a trail. He does not need to decide to become afraid. The fear response is both automatic and appropriate. First, it makes him want to flee. The fear then triggers bodily mechanisms that soup up his muscles so that he can run faster than he has ever run before. His heartbeat is quickened. Adrenaline, a powerful muscle stimulant, is poured into the bloodstream. All bodily functions not necessary to running are shut down. The stomach stops working and all available blood is sent to the muscles. Breathing is faster and the oxygen supply to the muscles is increased manyfold. All this, of course, is nothing new. Most of us learned it in high school. What we have not been so quick to realize, however, is that the brain and nervous system that reacts automatically to environment is the same brain and nervous system that tells us what the environment is. The reactions of the man meeting the bear are commonly thought of as due to emotion rather than to ideas. Yet, it was an idea information received from the outside world and evaluated by the mind that sparked the so-called emotional reactions. Thus, it was basically idea or belief that was the true causative agent rather than emotion which came as a result. In short, the man on the trail reacted to what he thought, believed, or imagined the environment to be. The messages brought to us from the environment consists of nerve impulses from the various sense organs. These nerve impulses are decoded, interpreted, and evaluated in the brain and made known to us in the form of ideas or mental images. In the final analysis, it is these mental images that we react to. Note that I've used the term thought, believed, and imagined as synonymous. In affecting your environment, they are all the same. You act and feel not according to what things are really like, but according to the image your mind holds of what they are like. You have certain mental images of yourself, your world, and the people around you, and you behave as though these images were the truth, the reality, rather than the things they represent. Suppose, for example, that the man on the trail had not met a real bear, but a movie actor dressed in a bear costume. If he thought and imagined the actor to be a bear, his emotional and nervous reactions would have been the same. Or suppose he met a large shaggy dog, which his fear-ridden imagination mistook for a bear. Again he would react automatically to what he believed to be true concerning himself and his environment. It follows that if our ideas and mental images concerning ourselves are distorted or unrealistic, then our reaction to our environment will likewise be inappropriate. Can these causative factors change? Certainly. Consider the child raised in an intentionally segregated environment by racists. The child could be a white person in a family of white supremacists who devoutly believe blacks are evil and a threat to their well-being. Or the child could be black in a family with comparable hatred for whites. Either way, the child is programmed with certain beliefs that will govern their behavior. 
in their imagination they construct certain truths that will be very difficult to modify as they mature. However, some people make a 180 degree change in their beliefs and behavior at some point in their lives. These days this has become a popular staple of the confrontation style daytime TV talk shows. How does a person change? Through life experience broader and more diverse than their family upbringing, societal pressure, being befriended by people of the race they were programmed to hate, in one way or another, challenging what they believe to be true, discovering it's based on an illusion rather than fact and replacing that truth with another truth. Now consider the child raised in a poor family, made up of people who profoundly believe that their unhappy circumstances are the fault of evil rich people and a corrupt government, who constantly program the child with class where warfare ideas, and who insist that they cannot get ahead no matter what they do. This truth may very well block that person's academic achievement, direct him away from college, have him blindly follow his father to work in the factory or the coal mine. Yet, even today, the basic path of accepting poverty as fact is prevalent in many, many people. But how does one person rise out of such a background to become a highly successful entrepreneur, for example, through books he's exposed to, people he, see on te he sees on television, the influence of a mentor, life experiences one way or another, challenging what he believed to be true, discovering it's based on illusion, and replacing that truth with another truth. Just as the Knights of Spanish Harlem I mentioned earlier transform from street toughs into chess champions, from likely criminals into model citizens, pursuing adult careers as doctors, lawyers, business persons, you can change from anything Aww. to anything by changing your self-image and providing it with new truth. From fat to flat, from fat and flabby to fit and strong, from mousy and timid to assertive and confident, from clumsy and awkward to capable and graceful. New evidence, actual experiential evidence and or vividly imagined synthetic evidence and or reinforcement from other authoritative influencers convinces the self-image. In turn, it relays the appropriate new directives to your circle servo mechanism and a new truth exists. A new reality occurs. Why not imagine yourself successful? Realizing that our actions, feelings, and behavior are the result of our own images and beliefs gives us the lever that psychology has always needed for changing personality. It opens a powerful psychological door to gaining skill, success, and happiness. Mental pictures offer us an opportunity to practice new traits and new attitudes which otherwise we could not do. This is possible because again your nervous system cannot tell the difference between an actual experience and one that is vividly imagined. If we picture ourselves performing in a certain manner it is nearly the same as the actual performance. Mental practice is as powerful as actual practice. When I first made this assertion and when others began making it it was a radical idea that you could practice in your imagination and achieve comparable results with no actual physical practice. Today it is widely accepted, having been proved by countless trials and experiments. Athletes of every stripe routinely rely on mental or imagination practice. For example, Consider Richard Koop's advice to golfers as follows. 
before you play any shot, you need to have a mental picture of how you want the ball to react once you deliver the club head to the ball. You need to have a definite positive visualization of what your shot will look like. The picture should indicate the trajectory, the direction, the spot where you intend the ball to land, and how far you want the ball to roll when it lands. If the flight of a shot is difficult for you to picture, try visualizing a strip of highway that curves in the manner that you wish your ball to travel. Your options in this visualization are limited only by your imagination. You might see the green as a pin cushion ready to accept your shot. Just pick visual images that work for you. Visualization is one of the most individual aspects of golf psychology. Jack Nicklaus has said, I never hit a shot without having a sharp picture of it in my head. First, I see where I want the ball to finish. Then I see it going there, its trajectory and landing. The next scene shows me making the swing that will turn the previous images into reality. Take note of the striking similarities between the Golden Bear's description of what he actually does, Dr. Koop's instruction, and the instructions in this book. It's important to understand that imagination practice need not be restricted to your golf swing or tennis swing. The same principles of mental practice apply to virtually anything, including broader behaviors such as speaking up confidently and asserting your opinions in business meetings versus remaining intimidated and silent and regretting it later, or asking prospects directly for orders rather than leaving sales presentations hanging with wimpy vague endings and so on. I have developed a very specific regimen for mental or imagination practice using what I call the theater of the mind, which I will get to later. Dr. Koop also goes on to describe virtually the same mental movie technique I first began teaching in the late 1950s and wrote about in the original version of this book. Jack Nicholas uses the word scene. He is playing out his successful shot as a little mental movie, literally stepping out of actual play and into the theater of the mind to watch the movie, then stepping back out to the experience and experiencing a deja vu effect. In an article in Golf Magazine, July 2000, Jack Nicholas said, the more deeply you ingrain what I like to call my going to the movies discipline, the more effective you become at hitting the shots you wanna hit. In his four step process, in step four, he even says, select the club that the completed movie tells you is the right one. Remarkably, Jack Nicholas has found his way to virtually the same mental movie techniques I prescribe, even going so far as to turn the pesky details of the correct club selection over to his automatic success mechanism rather than attempting conscious choice. I say remarkably because as far as I know, Mr. Nicholas has never read this book, although he has likely been influenced by many other golfers and golf coaches who have. However, it's not really all that remarkable since it seems almost all peak performers find their way to this technique one way or another. In a few moments, we'll talk more about the specifics of these mental movies. Let me first tell you about some of the scientific documentation that supports the entire idea of imagination practice. In one of the first controlled experiments I read about, psychologist R.A. Vandal proved that mental practice in throwing darts at a target wherein the person sits for a period each day in front of the target and imagines throwing darts at it improves aim just as much as actually throwing darts. 
Research Quarterly reported an experiment on the effects of mental practice on improving skills in sinking basketball free throws. One group of students actually practiced throwing the ball every day for 20 days and were scored on the first and last days. A second group was scored on the first and last days and engaged in no sort of practice in between. And a third group was scored on the first day then spent 20 minutes a day imagining they were throwing the ball at the goal. When they missed, they would imagine that they corrected their aim accordingly. In the first group, which actually practiced 20 minutes every day, they improved in scoring 24%. The second group, which had no sort of practice, had no improvement, and the third group, which practiced only in their imagination, improved in scoring 23%. This particular experiment has been widely reported and referenced since, and since repeated at many universities over the years. Of course, none of this is infallible. After all, Shaq's problems with foul shots remain a mystery. Ha, ha, ha. However, while an inexact science the use of imagination practice is nevertheless an effective science, a proven and practical means of improving skills or altering embedded truths in order to alter behavior. Mental pictures are powerful medicine. Kay Porter, PhD, and Judy Foster, authors of The Mental Athlete, Inner Training for Peak Performance, provided an excellent detailed prescription for relieving pain and accelerating recovery from injury. In an article in Tennis World magazine, they noted an important element of self-healing is a mental image that projects a positive future outcome. This visualization stimulates your mind and body and creates an intention to heal. Through mental imagery, it is possible to alter the body's autonomic physiological responses. When you use imagination, mental pictures, and suggestion, you can communicate with your body and make it respond. Make no mistake, this is medical, scientific truth, not mumbo jumbo. If every hospital patient and every person entering physical rehab were given a copy of Psycho-Cybernetics, they would be considerably better off. Keep this in mind if you ever have a loved one or friend in such circumstances. This article is so revealing and useful, we've posted more extensive experts at the psych excerpts at the Psycho-Cybernetics Foundation website, www.psycho-cybernetics.com, should you care to read it or refer a friend to it. Mental pictures can help you sell at a higher level. In his book, How to Make 25000 a Year Selling, Charles B. Roth told how a group of salespeople in Detroit who tried a new idea increased their sales 100%. In another group in New York, they increased their sales by 150%, and individual salespeople using the same idea increased their sales up to 400%. And what is this magic that accomplishes so much for salespeople? From Dr. Roth's book, he says, it's something called role playing, and you should know about it because if you let it, it may help you to double your sales. What is role playing? Well, simply imagining yourself in various sales situations, then solving them in your mind until you know what to say and know what to do whenever the situation comes up in real life. The reason why it accomplishes so much is that selling is simply a matter of situations. One is created every time you talk to a customer. He says something or asks a question or raises an objection. If you always know how to counter what he says or answer his question or handle the objection, you make sales. A role-playing salesman at night when he is alone will create these situations. He will imagine the prospect throwing the widest kind of curves at him. Then 
you will work out the best answer to them. No matter what the situation is, you can prepare for it beforehand by means of imagining yourself and your prospect face to face while he is raising objections and creating problems and you are handling them properly. I suspect Mr. Roth's book is now out of print. The 25,000 in its title telegraphs its age, but countless sales books, sales training programs, and professional sales trainers have since incorporated this idea into their methods and advice to sales professionals. In fact, if you are engaged in the field of selling, you've undoubtedly participated in actual role playing in the classroom, in the seminar room, or at a sales meeting, and may have then practiced with a colleague or a spouse. What you may have not realized is that moving the role playing from the seminar room to the theater of the mind can be just as effective and arguably more effective because you can progress from fumbling awkwardness and uncertainty to perfection and success. You can then rehearse only that drama repetitively until it becomes second nature and your real selling experiences so closely mirror those practiced, mirror those practiced perfectly in your imagination that they are deja vu. If you view negotiation as high level selling, then this story demonstrates this well. It is a letter I received from a professional brought in by a company to represent it in a very complex and challenging negotiation with millions of dollars at stake. With the CEO of a public company famous for being difficult, while I cannot reveal the names involved, I assure you the letter is in my possession. Here it is, excerpted in part. Dear Dr. Maltz, since I had the luxury of several weeks to prepare for our first meeting that I would take place that would take place behind closed doors, I immersed myself in preparation by studying everything I could obtain about this man. I read a book he had written, books and articles about him, watched videotapes and interviews with him from TV networks and programs, analyzed his biography, and ultimately produced a walking, talking replica of him in my imagination so that I could carry on conversations with him. I did not have means to have someone else ably act as this person in my actual role play as politicians do when preparing for debates, so instead I created an imaginary clone. Frankly, I chose not to let any of my associates know exactly what I was doing for fear of having the men in the white coats called. My client might have had second thoughts about entrusting this high wire negotiation to someone who had an imaginary man he was talking with for hours each day. Anyway, I followed the instructions I found in your book, psycho as an inspiration for my approach. After constructing this imaginary person, I then spent hours in what you call the theater of the mind, actually playing out the meeting and dialogue we would have. Myself, the scriptwriter, director, lead actor, and observer, which I found difficult at first, but less difficult as I stayed with it. Soon, I found my imagined clone raising issues and questions and arguments of his own. Once I recall sitting in my easy chair, eyes closed, immersed in this imaginary meeting, catching myself, losing my temper, and pounding my fist on the arm of the chair. As this evolved into a mental movie with a successful outcome, I transitioned into replaying that identical movie repeatedly. I even went so far after many viewings to write it out word for word as if a courtroom transcriptionist was there to accurately record our conversation word for word. Here is what is remarkable. When the actual meeting took place, not only did it follow my script in order and flow, and not only did I voice things exactly as I had many times in the mental movie, as you might expect. But he also performed as if he were working from the very same script. In his letter, he goes on to describe a very successful outcome and earning a substantial fee. By the way, I received this letter in 19, four, 1974, 14 years after the first publication of my book. 
he made mention of noting its copyright and at first questioning how relevant and beneficial such old techniques might be. You may very well be reading this book 40 years or more after the first edition, and even after I have left the living, it will not matter. These techniques will be used by top professionals in every field of endeavor long after the bulky computer has been reduced to a device you can wear on your arm like a wristwatch. There is now a book based on psychocybernetics specifically for professional salespeople, Zero Resistance, Zero Resistance Selling, available in bookstores or at psychocybernetics.com. Use mental pictures to get a better job. The late William Marston, well-known psychologist, recommended what he called rehearsal practice to men and women who came to him for help in job advancement. If you have an important interview coming up, such as making an application for a job, his advice was plan for the interview in advance. Go over it in your mind, all the various questions you are likely to be asked. Think about the answers you're going to give, then rehearse the interview in your mind. Even if none of the questions you have rehearsed come up, the rehearsal practice will still work wonders. It gives you confidence, and even though real life has no set lines to be recited like a stage play, rehearsal practice will help you to ad-lib and react spontaneously to whatever situation you find yourself in because you have practiced reacting spontaneously. This should come as no surprise based on everything I just had to say about mental rehearsal for sales professionals. In a job interview, you are selling yourself. You are the product and its sales representative. Like the negotiator, you may even have the luxury of time, several weeks, maybe even several months, to plan and prepare to search for a new or better position. If so, by all means, use it to your advantage by using your imagination to construct the perfect job interview so that when the actual interviews take place, you'll be relaxed confident and comfortable. A concert pianist practices in his head. Arthur Schnabel, the world famous concert pianist, took lessons for only seven years. He hated practice and seldom practiced for any length of time at the actual piano keyboard. When questioned about his small amount of practice as compared with other concert pianists, he said, I practice in my head. C.G. Kopp of Holland, a recognized author on teaching piano, recommends that all pianists practice in their head. A new composition, he says, should be first gone over in the mind. It should be memorized and played in the mind before ever touching fingers to the keyboard. Practicing in the head has actually become the basis for quite a bit of modern piano instruction. Composer, performer, and instructor Patty Carlson achieved considerable fame promoting her How to Play Piano Overnight video program in which she teaches people how to feel the music rather than learning to read sheet music and engage in tedious practice. So now, imagination practice can lower your golf score Golf has become an enormously popular recreation and there's a long relationship between golf and psychocybernetics. I've already mentioned the great Jack Nicklaus's mental rehearsal as just one example. Time Magazine reported that when Ben Hogan was playing in a tournament, he mentally rehearsed each shot just before making it. He made the shot perfectly in his imagination, felt the club head strike the ball just as it should, felt himself performing the follow through, and then stepped up to the ball and depended on what he called muscle memory to carry out the shot just as he imagined it. Ben Hogan was ahead of the curve of 
modern golf psychology which has become an industry unto itself and is largely based on visualization and relaxation techniques. Alex Morrison, perhaps the best known golf instructor in the world at the time I was writing the first edition of this book, actually worked out a system of mental practice to improve your golf score while sitting in an easy chair and practicing mentally what he called the seven Morrison keys. According to Morrison, the mental side of golf represents 90% of the game. The physical side, 8%, and the mechanical side, 2%. In his book, Better Golf Without Practice, Morrison told how he taught Lou Lair to break 90 for the first time with no actual practice whatsoever. Morrison had Lair sit in an easy chair in his living room and relax while he demonstrated for him the correct swing and gave a brief lecture on the Morrison keys. Lair was instructed to engage in no actual practice on the links, but instead spend five minutes each day relaxing in his easy chair, visualizing himself attending to the keys correctly. Morrison goes on to report how several days later, with no physical preparation whatever, Lair joined his regular foursome and amazed them by shooting nine holes in an even par 36. The core of the Morrison system is you must have a clear mental picture of the correct thing before you can do it successfully. Morrison, by this method, enabled many celebrities to chop as many as 10 to 12 strokes off of their scores. Clearly see the target and let your automatic success mechanism take care of the details. John Bulla, a well-known professional golfer, wrote an article in which he said that having a clear mental picture of just where you wanted the ball to go and what you wanted it to do was more important than form in golf. Most of the pros, said Bulla, have one or more serious flaws in their form, yet they managed to shoot good golf. It was Bulla's theory that if you picture the end result and see the ball going where you want it to go and have the confidence to know what, know that it was going to do what you wanted, your subconscious would take over and direct your muscles correctly. If your grip was wrong and your stance was not in the best form, your subconscious would still take care of that by directing your muscles to do whatever was necessary to compensate for the error in form. This describes the payoff of mastering these psychocybernetics techniques, that you reach a point of efficiency where you can simply quickly hand a clear picture of the desired outcome over to your servo mechanism and let it take care of the mechanical details of making that outcome take place. Golf is such an excellent laboratory for these techniques because unlike many other sports, it is stripped down to pure competition with yourself. Morrison's coaching of Lair exclusively with mental practice came many years before Tim Galway, author of The Inner Game of Tennis, accepted the challenge of an experiment to see how much golf he could learn just by adapting the inner game mental skills he had developed in playing and coaching tennis. He set the goal of breaking 80 while playing only once weekly, receiving no technical instruction, and otherwise relying on practice and his imagination in one year or less. At that time, he played only several times a year, scoring between 95 and 105. His diary of that experiment is included in his book, The Inner Game of Golf. The book is well worth reading, whether you have any interest in golf or not, as it is a thoroughly detailed case history in the triumph 
of mind over mechanics or technical information actually the triumph of psycho cybernetics over the years I've had the pleasure of working with many top golfers and golf instructors and although professional discretion requires me to maintain confidentiality for most of them some engineered their improvement with only this book and no other assistance from me here's one that is public knowledge in 1964 Dave Stockton was struggling to survive on the pro tour overall I was playing well but my putting was lousy Stockton told an LA Times reporter my father a retired pro insisted my put putting problems were mental not physical and he gave me a copy of Psycho Cybernetics to read I read it just one week before the PGA tournament then I went in knowing I was going to win Dave Stockton beat Arnold Palmer in that event and went on to enjoy a long and successful career in fact he became most famous for his putting and 22 years later Dave won the, U the 1996 U.S. Senior Open. The Real Secret of Mental Picturing Successful men and women have, since the beginning of time, used mental pictures and rehearsal practice to achieve success. Napoleon, for example, practiced soldiering in his imagination for many years before he ever went on to an actual battlefield. Webb and Morgan in their book Making the Most of Your Life tells us that the notes of Napoleon made from his readings during these years of study filled when printed 400 pages. He imagined himself as a commander and drew maps of the island of Corsica knowing where he would place his calculations with mathematical precision. Conrad Hilton imagined himself operating a hotel long before he ever bought one. As a boy, he used to play that he was a hotel operator. His earliest successes were in buying dilapidated dowager properties and restoring their beauty, rebirthing them as first-class properties. He said that when he spotted such a property to acquire, he ceased seeing its actual condition instead formed a vividly detailed collection of photographs in his mind of the hotel as it would appear after its makeover. By seeing what would be, he saw value invisible to others. A strong mental picture can pull you towards success even when you have no logical argument for it. Jane Savoy is one of the most respected horse riding coaches in America. In 2000, she coached the U.S. Olympic equestrian team competing in Sydney. She describes an instance in which imagination power superseded probabilities. Take for example my experience at the screening trials for the North American Championship in 1989. I had a whole bunch of facts that supported the improbability of my doing well at the screening trials. I have a top horse, Zapatero, but the other facts were, one, Zapatero was new to me and we had not time to develop a solid relationship and real communications. Two, he was a young horse and not yet strong enough to do what was required. These facts made it difficult to imagine the perfect test. So I visualized the award ceremony instead. Several times over the course of the day, I would find a quiet spot, close my eyes, relax, and visualize leading the victory lap. In the process, I stopped thinking about the facts and thus prevented doubts and insecurities from creeping in. When the results were posted, Zapatero and I were in fact there to lead the lap of honor. It sounds incredible, and I in no way minimize the necessity for all the preparation and hard work involved. But mentally zeroing in on the desired results as if they were already there in existence was an significant factor in our ultimate success. It was important to focus on a positive outcome as a foregone conclusion rather than allow my rather vivid imagination to conjure up failure pictures. 
in my mind, servo mechanism could then supply the means to achieve my goal by helping me to letting me ride skillfully and effectively. Of course, the skeptic would want to attribute this incident to coincidence or luck, but Jane Savoy is a practiced, skilled practitioner of psychocybernetics with many evidentiary incidents to support her convictions. In fact, she has utilized psychocybernetics for many years as an instructor and ch coach of champion riders, as noted most recently with the Olympic team. In a single, simple, vividly imagined picture of successful achievement, that could be enough to block out doubts, fears, insecurities, and worries, and direct the success mechanism to the desired target. Full-scale mental rehearsal is even more important. There is simply no sensible case to be made anymore against incorporating mental rehearsal into your own daily regimen, whether you are a pro or a weekend athlete, sales professional, entrepreneur, executive, school teacher, doctor, whatever. This evidence mandates that you learn and use this tool and do so regularly for a myriad of productive purposes. It's fair to insist that if you are not utilizing this approach, you are operating without benefit of one of the fundamental, universal, most relied on psychological tools of success we know of. It's much like being a carpenter choosing to operate without the benefit of electric power and power tools. You could, but why? Why mental picturing is so powerful. The science of cybernetics gives us insight into why mental picturing produces such amazing results. I find that the more people understand about why this works so well, the more likely they are to use it. This automatic success mechanism within you, a highly complex, automatic, goal-seeking machine that steers its way to a target or goal by use of feedback data and stored information, automatically correcting course when necessary, can operate in only one way. It must have a target to shoot at. As the famous golf instructor Alex Morrison said, you must first clearly see a thing in your mind before you can do it. As stated earlier, this new concept does not mean that you are a machine, but that your physical brain and body functions as a machine that you operate. When you see a thing clearly in your mind, your creative, quote, success mechanism within you takes over and does the job much better than you can do it by conscious effort or willpower. Instead of trying hard by conscious effort, to do the thing by iron-jawed iron willpower, all the while worrying and picturing to yourself all the things that are likely to go wrong, you simply relax. Stop trying to do it by strain and effort. Picture the target you really want to hit and let your creative success mechanism take over. You are not relieved thereafter from effort and work. But your efforts are used to carry you forward towards your goal rather than in futile mental conflict which results when you want to try to do one thing but picture yourself doing something else. Finding your best self. This same creative mechanism within you can help you achieve your best possible self if you will form a picture in your imagination of the self you want to be and see yourself in the new role. This is a necessary condition to personality transformation. 
regardless of the method of therapy used. Somehow, before you can change, you must see yourself in a new role. I myself have witnessed veritable miracles in personality transformation when an individual changes his or her self-image. However, today we are only beginning to glimpse the potential creative power that stems from the human imagination, particularly images concerning ourselves. Consider the implications, for example, in the following news release which appeared in 1958 under an Associated Press Dateline. Just imagine you're saying, San Francisco, some mental patients can improve their lot and perhaps shorten their stay in the hospital by just imagining they are normal, two psychologists with the Veterans Administration at Los Angeles reported. Dr. Harry Grayson and Dr. Leonard Olinger told the American Psychological Association they tried the idea on 45 hospitalized as neuropsychiatrics. The patients were first given the usual personality test. Then they were asked flatly to take the, set, the test a second time and answer the questions as they would if they were a typical well-adjusted person on the outside. Three-fourths of them turned in improved test performances, and some of the changes for the better were dramatic, the psycholog psychologist reported. In order for these patients to answer the questions as a typical well-adjusted person would answer, they had to imagine how a typical well-adjusted person would act. They had to imagine themselves in the role of a well-adjusted person, and this in itself was enough to cause them to begin acting like and feeling like a well-adjusted person. I am not certain what became of these good doctors and their innovative experiments. However, we know today that every aspect of self-image psychology, the very idea of self-image as steersman, and related techniques like act as if visualization are widely accepted and used in assisting the mentally ill, the handicapped, addicts, and incarcerated inmates involved with rehabilitation. Of course, you are probably not clinically insane or addicted to chemicals, but more likely a successful individual looking to psychocybernetics to help you do even more or to improve some aspect of your life. The fact that these techniques have become part and parcel of most therapies and treatments for people with far more severe emotional and psychological difficulties than you face, or can even imagine, holds out for you the promise that they can be even more powerful, fast-acting, and effective from your comparable starting point. Discover the truth about yourself. The aim of self-image psychology is not to create a fictitious self that is all-powerful, arrogant, egoistic, all-important. Such an image is as inappropriate and unrealistic as the inferior image of self. Our aim is to find the real self. However, it is common knowledge among psychologists that most of us underrate ourselves, shortchange ourselves, sell ourselves short. Actually, there is no such thing as a superiority complex. People who seem to have one are actually suffering from feelings of inferiority. Their superior self is a fiction, a cover-up to hide from themselves and, uh, and others, their deep-down feelings of inferiority and insecurity. How can you discover the truth about yourself? How can you make a true evaluation? It seems to me that here 
psychology must turn to religion. The scriptures tell us that God created man a little lower than the angels and gave him dominion, that God created man in his own image. If we really believe in an all-wise, all-powerful, all-loving creator, then how can we draw some logical conclusions about what he has created? Man. In the first place, such an all-wise, all-powerful creator would not turn out inferior products any more than a master painter would paint inferior canvases. Such a creator would not deliberately engineer the products to fail any more than a manufacturer would deliberately build failure into an automobile. The fundamentalists tell us that man's chief purpose and reason for living, reason for living is to glorify God. And the humanists tell us that man's primary purpose is to express himself fully. However, if we take the premise that God is a loving creator and has the same interest in creation that an earthly father has in his children, then it seems to me that the fundamentalists and the humanists are saying the same thing. What brings more glory, pride, and satisfaction to a father than seeing his offspring do well, succeed and express to their full their abilities and talents? Have you ever sat by the father of a football star during a game? Jesus expressed the same thought when he told us not to hide our light under a bushel, but to let our light shine so that your father may be glorified. I cannot believe that it brings any glory to God when his children go around with hangdog expressions being miserable, afraid to lift up their heads and be somebody. Over the years, following the first publication of the book, I've been invited to speak at many different kinds of churches from evangelical Christian to Baptist to Episcopal to so-called New Thought and Science of Mind. I've had in-depth discussions about psychocybernetics with ministers, priests, a Zen monk, agnostics, and even atheists. I have had no difficulty navigating these different waters, and we have always found common ground in the basic premise of liberating individuals from their own inner, mental, and often unconscious self-sabotage, and the corollary premise of individuals being intended, if not engineered, to succeed, not fail. Dr. Norman Vincent Peale had kind things to say about psychocybernetics, and he and I had several good discussions, even though I have on occasion commented that simple positive thinking, as most people think of it, is too often destined to disappoint as it tries to force the issue from the circumference of our being rather than to reprogram at the core. I don't think you can have a legitimate religious or spiritual disagreement with psychocybernetics. The final word on imagination practice. It doesn't matter what religious, spiritual, or philosophical background or viewpoint you come from. It doesn't matter how you describe it. Imagination, practice, visualization, mental picturing, or using my terminology, theater of your mind. What's important is you do it. If you would choose a target to apply this to and give it a solid, honest 21-day trial, you will be so gratified with the results that you will certainly choose to continue using this tool for the rest of your life and benefit enormously by doing so, just as countless athletes, entertainers, doctors, lawyers, business leaders, and others have before you. Here are just a few exercises to get you started. Mental training exercise. Your present self-image was built on your own imagination pictures of yourself in the past 
which grew out of interpretations and evaluations you place on experience. Now you're going to use the same method to build an adequate self-image that you previously used to build an inadequate one. Set aside a period of 30 minutes each day where you can be alone and undisturbed. Relax and make yourself as comfortable as possible. Now close your eyes and exercise your imagination. Many people find they get better results if they imagine themselves sitting before a large motion picture screen and imagine that they are seeing a motion picture of themselves. The important thing is to make these pictures as vivid and as detailed as possible. You want your mental pictures to approximate actual experience as much as possible. The way to do this is to pay attention to the small details, sights, sounds, objects in your imagined environment. Details of the imagined environment are all important in this exercise because for all practical purposes you are creating a practice experience and the imagination is vivid enough and detailed enough if it is your imagination practice is equivalent to an actual experience insofar as your nervous system is concerned the next important thing to remember is that during these 30 minutes you see yourself acting and reacting appropriately successfully ideally it doesn't matter how you acted yesterday you don't need you don't need to try to have faith you will act in the ideal way tomorrow your nervous system will take care of all of that in time if you continue to practice see yourself acting feeling being as you want to be do not say to yourself I'm going to act this way tomorrow just say to yourself I'm going to imagine myself acting this way right now for 30 minutes today imagine how you would feel if you were already the sort of personality you want to be if you have been shy and timid see yourself moving among people with ease and poise and feeling good because of it if you have been fearful and anxious in certain situations see yourself acting calmly and deliberately acting with confidence and courage and feeling expansive and confident because you are this exercise builds new memories or stored data in your midbrain and central nervous system it builds a new self-image after practicing for a time you'll be surprised to find after practicing it for a time you will be surprised to find yourself acting differently more or less automatically and spontaneously without trying this is as it should be you do not need to take thought or try to make an effort now in order to feel ineffective and act inadequate your present inadequate feeling and doing are automatic and spontaneous because of the memories real and imagined you have built into your automatic mechanism you will find it will work just as automatically upon positive thoughts and experiences as upon negative ones step one take pad and pen and write out a brief outline or description of the mental movie you intend to construct experiment with develop and view in the theater of the mind step two set aside 30 minutes a day preferably at the same time each day to find a quiet private place relax close your eyes into your theater and begin playing editing and replaying your movie step three gradually massage your movie so that its star you performs exactly as you desire and achieves the experience and results you desire strive to arrive at this point within the first 10 days Step four, for the remaining 11 days, play and enjoy that movie repeatedly without change.